Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What is the United Nations Association of the USA? How does UNA USA provide objective information about the United Nations and international issues? My guest today is going to bring us up to date on this interesting organization and this particular mission. Rachel Pittman is the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the United States of America. Ms. Pittman is the first African-American Executive Director of UNA USA. Rachel Pittman, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. It's nice to be here with you. Great to see you again. You and I go back a long way. We're both in the United Nations Association and have been for many years. And you are, you're the director. Congratulations. Uh, it's not just yesterday, but recently uh, you've been appointed, but uh, we're delighted that you're in that position. Let's start off with a very basic about the UNA USA. What, what is its mission? What does it do? What, what is it about? Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again for having me. And uh, the United Nations Association of the USA, uh, we are a grassroots movement of Americans that support the vital work of the UN and its agencies, as well as work on it or achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, we have 20,000 members, 60% of them are under the age of 26, and they live in all 50 states, Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. And our members belong to over 220 chapters that we have within the United States. Some of them are on college campuses and others are in the communities. So our members work closely in their communities to educate people about the work of the UN. They do this through public events, uh, through volunteer activities. They work with a lot of youth just to tell the story of the UN, talk about why the UN matters and why it's important to them and why others should support them as well. They uh, really work on our big advocacy ask, which is talk to our members of Congress about why it's so important to have strong U.S. leadership at the UN, as well as full U.S. funding for the UN. So our members are busy throughout the year uh, doing different types of programs to support the United Nations. They certainly are. You have a myriad of programs. We're going to start off with a little more history. You've got a brief video of the history of the United Nations Association. It runs for about a minute, 30 seconds. We'll take a look at that and come back and talk about it. And then we'll move into your programs. So let's take a look at the video. Rachel, that gives an excellent overview of a very brief overview of how the UNA USA started and what some of its major activities are. In that, I couldn't help but notice, obviously, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, of course, we remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was president uh, during most of World War II, was the uh, person who really launched the United Nations. And of course, Eleanor Roosevelt became very prominent later. She was one who was instrumental in getting the General Assembly of the UN to develop the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What role did Eleanor Roosevelt play in the UNA USA in its earlier days? 
Eleanor Roosevelt was one of our biggest leaders and champions. She was a chairwoman of UNA USA. When she was done shepherding the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights to its fruition, she got more involved with UNA USA and used to travel across the US helping to build this, these chapters. Many of them are still here today, uh, helping Americans understand why the United Nations and so was so important. So she was very much involved in our organization. She was a giant. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Everything she did, she did well, and she really threw herself into it. Well, UNA USA is one of the largest nonpartisan foreign policy associations in the United States. You mentioned you have over 20,000 members. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. You're a part of the World Federation of United Nations Associations, which is about 100 plus maybe other UNAs like in France, Japan, and countries like that, again, to help people understand these international issues and the logical role of the UN. And our viewers can go to your website at www.unausa.org to get more information. I, you were talking about the diversity and how UNA membership and the composition has changed. How has it changed over the years? Yeah, over it's 70 plus years. Yeah, it's definitely shifted. Um, UNA USA, before the UN was started, let's go back a little bit. There was a group of Americans uh, that were part of the American Association for the UN who advocated for the formation of the United Nations along with about 40 other associations. And over the years, um, it became UNA USA officially, but this group provided more guidance on the importance of the UN through lectures and through white papers. And it's transformed over the years where now we are an advocacy movement. We are contacting our legislators and members of Congress talking about the work of the UN and why we need once again to have funding for the UN. We are acting on the sustainable development goal. So, you know, all of these issues are affecting more and more people. Um, and it's just become more diverse in, in the people that are participating because of the issues that are being involved. Um, so we have now a lot of young people, a lot of youth leaders that are involved in our movement um, and people from all you know, racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds. It's just such a more diverse community that we have and it looks more like America. You mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, those were 17 very laudable goals adopted in 2015, implemented uh, beginning of uh, 2016, they run through 2030, to basically to try to eliminate poverty and hunger, to promote gender equity and equality, to eliminate or slow down anyway, not eliminate perhaps climate change, uh, just a variety of very laudable goals and there are a lot of other groups that support a large number of these goals. I know Rotary International does, uh, Kiwanis, Lions, just on across the board. But these are really very important goals that so many, I mean, literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world are working to achieve. Absolutely. And these goals are not just goals that were adopted by member states and supported by organizations like Rotary, Lions Club, and UNA. It's, it's where um, we are activating. We are helping to advance the su sustainable development goals, meaning that we believe that we get involved locally to tackle education inequality, poverty issues, hunger issues in our own communities, as well as worldwide. The sustainable development goals is not just for countries that are outside of the United States, but it's for us here at home. So you, as UNA USA, we help to educate people about the sustainable development goals, but we also activate on the sustainable development goals because we want those changes here in the United States as well. That's extremely important. Uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright once said, the UN is not perfect but it is certainly indispensable. It's the only international organization that brings basically every country of the world together, 193 countries under one roof. 
the UN, again, is not, I don't think anybody at the UN or anyplace else would argue it's a perfect organization, but it, it is one that we absolutely need. How do you convey that message to the American public? Because so much of the information, or I should say misinformation out there put out by talk radio, I hear it all the time on talk radio, on some of the TV stations, they, they just uh, totally miss the mark as far as talking objectively about the role of the UN and its strengths and weaknesses. So how do you convey that message? Yeah, well, what we do is one, um, we use things like the sustainable development goals to help people connect to the issues. You know, like I said before, we have hunger issues, education issues, climate issues here in the US, and we help them understand that these are the issues that the United Nations is working on globally. The other thing is storytelling being able to share the stories of the work of the UN and how they're making a difference. We're seeing a lot of that through the pandemic. We're seeing the UN out in the field, helping to educate first line workers, helping to provide them more PPE, you know, showing how they're making a difference uh, so that people can understand it's not just this big building up in New York City. Uh, it's an organization that is global, that is multilateral, uh, that is working together to solve these major issues around the world. So it's just talking more to people so that they better understand and giving them the information that they need. And you mentioned more or less the boots on the ground and getting the information out. I know for a fact, uh, I've been involved with Rotary for many years, and one of the greatest international health programs, the Polio Plus program, between Rotary International, the UN World Health Organization, and the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, and of course the US Centers for Disease Control. And there are thousands of UNICEF workers who team up with Rotarians to go out to immunize children in many of the far-flung areas of the world. And they are truly the boots on the ground. Absolutely. Well, well you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a computer, you have a website, you like our shows, you want to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections is provided as a public service at no charge to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking with Ms. Rachel Pittman. Ms. Pittman is the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA. And we're talking about the role of UNA USA in helping to disseminate objective information about the United Nations so we can make better decisions on how better to deal with these international issues, such as climate change, human trafficking, or whatever it may be, and look at how they, these impact our lives. Rachel, we've got a, a full plate to cover here. Uh, there's so many issues I've noticed uh, just over the past four years, uh, the US has withdrawn from a lot of the UN agencies and the foreign policy experts say this is to the detriment of the United States and it destabilizes the world because the US is a leader, or was a leader, it hadn't been uh, for many years now, but it is it should be the leader in dealing with health issues or dealing with human trafficking or human rights. Uh, what, uh, how, how do you perceive our, uh, well, let's say future involvement in the UN agencies? It looks like we're going to be going back into the Paris Climate Change Accord, uh, different things like that. So how, how do you perceive that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's all good things. Um, President-elect Biden has said that he will re-enter the Paris Agreement, as you said, uh, halt the, the US's withdrawal from WHO. And um, I mean, all of this is so important because we have to have a seat at the table. We have to be able to be there to help influence decisions that are gonna be made on global issues. So it's so important that we re-engage um, things like the Human Rights Council, um, and all the other organizations that you just mentioned. That is so true. It, whenever the US withdraws, we've seen it in the past, there is a vacuum that's created, a political vacuum, and somebody will fill it. 
And over the past couple of years, we've seen China has been more than happy to fill that role and to take a leadership role where the U.S. has basically moved to the sidelines and not played a very active role. Well, what, uh, which do you think are some of the most important of the UN, you mentioned the World Health Organization, Human Rights Council, uh, they're all important, but uh, let's, let's focus on peacekeeping. Why is it important to be involved in peacekeeping? Um, peacekeeping, being involved in peacekeeping is just the right thing to do. As peacekeepers, they help to fight uh, terrorism that, um, that's going on in, in certain regions of the world. They work on humanitarian issues uh, to help restructure and rebuild war-torn areas. They help with fair elections as well, which is something that's very important to us. And we as, U as the United States should be engaged in supporting peacekeepers um, because you know, there are things in the world that we don't want to come here to the US. So this is our way of supporting uh, and, and preventing certain issues around the world. Uh, and just furthermore, you know, we should be helping to continue to fund peacekeeping and, and lift the cap of, of our budget uh, for peacekeeping. And uh, it's, it's so economical, people just don't understand. It's better for us as the US to provide these funds than as a member of the UN to send our men and women in harm's way by putting them out on the ground. It's a lot easier if we support it through funding than for our, our men and women to be out there uh, as well. That's very important. And as you mentioned, when you when you and peacekeepers are in South Sudan or the Democratic Republic of Congo or wherever it may be, there are no U.S. troops on the front lines. That is a tremendous savings. But also the U.S. Government Accountability Office, as I recall, I think it was GAO, did a study years ago that showed it's eight times cheaper to have the United Nations involved in peacekeeping than to have the U.S. involved. So it's it's a it's a it's from a human standpoint and also from the financial standpoint, it just makes good sense. Well, often we hear the myth that the UN, the U.S. is paying the budget at the UN. The UN is a super rich organization. Uh, how much does the U.S. pay at the UN headquarters and then in peacekeeping? Yeah, you know, in total, our um, we spend less than one percent of our federal budget. Uh, for to fund the UN's budget in peacekeeping. So this is something that is achievable and that we should continue to support. And the budget is negotiated every single year. So we have the capability to talk about how much the US should pay um, the UN. And it's also done through assessment of our uh, global, our, of, of our own economy. You know, we're one of the largest world economies uh, and we look at, the UN looks at what each country should be able to pay. And what we pay, once again, is less than 1% of our federal budget. And if really years ago, we used to pay more than that, it's based on the wealth of the country. And it's a very fair formula. Now, there are some countries that need to raise their dues, no doubt about that. But we have really lowered ours. And in fact, the Europeans often comment, that the U.S. should be paying 28% of the U.N. budget instead of 22% of the U.N. budget because, first off, the United States benefits more from the United Nations than just about any country on the planet. If you go through that whole list of U.N. agencies where U.N. helps to move aircraft, ships, mail, weather information, it's just one, one program after another that benefits not just the U.S., but we are the, lar we are the largest uh, 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 recipient, I should say, in many respects. And Bill, US those programs. are the things that we're going to ask uh, the the uh, incoming administration is to restore uh, our funding that we should be paying to the UN to pay down our arrears as well, mm -hmm. but also looking at refunding mm -hmm. and restoring funding to those UN agencies that we stopped giving funds to such as UNRWA and UNICEF and OHCHR and UN Women um, and to restore their funding so that they can do the work that needs to be done. And those are all very important programs. They're important for the people who are the recipients of them, maybe in other parts of the world, but also for us in this country. 
Well, again, we, we have so many myths. I don't want to dwell on all of them. We couldn't do it in one program. But one you hear is about U.S. sovereignty and how when we participate in U.N. programs or even with NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or other groups like that, that we lose our sovereignty. How, how do you address that? As being active leaders in these organizations, we're not losing our sovereignty. Um, we are helping uh, to have more multilateral engagement in these organizations, and we're not bounded. Um, if you, if you know, some people think that the by being part of the United Nations, it's a it's a legal organization that mandates and dictates what the United States can do. That is not the type of organization the United Nations is. Um, they uh, come together in countries agree on issues and how they plan to operate in their own countries, but they're not mandates. They're not legal mandates. And I think that's so important for people to understand. And that's just like the Paris Climate Accord. It, it was voluntary. It, it didn't impose any restrictions on the United States. In fact, it gave the U.S. a chance to be a leader and to move into more into clean energy and to actually create tens of millions more jobs and to move away from fossil fuels. But there, there are a lot of myths that are out there. But Rachel, very quickly, before we run out of time, uh, you mentioned earlier about the Sustainable Development Goals. There's the Decade of Action that's sort of tied into that. What is the Decade of Action? So the Decade of Action simply means that we have 10 years left to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And unfortunately, things like the pandemic has pushed us back in achieving those goals. So we need to double down, roll up our sleeves and get moving and activate so that we can achieve those 17 Sustainable Development Goals the world's largest to-do list by the year 2030. And COVID has pushed us back a bit, but hopefully we see the light at the end of the tunnel and hopefully it's not an oncoming train. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna remain positive on this. Well, Rachel, just in closing, what do you see as your major challenge as you move forward uh, to try to help inform the American public about uh, the role, of the logical, legal, legitimate role of the United Nations? Yeah, so I think the major challenge uh, in working with the American community, it's just to be able to continue to tell the UN story and have more and more people understand the work that they're doing. So the challenge is just to get our UNA USA members out there. Um, and if it's, you know, we continue with Zoom for the next 20, uh, in, in 2021, for the next several months just being able to continue to talk to individuals and talk about why the UN matters and why there must be strong US leadership at the UN. So uh, I think we will, we will get there and we'll get more and more people to understand. And the more people understand about the UN, the more they realize it touches their lives every day and it provides basic services that we need in this country. I know I've done slideshows on how Rotary and the United Nations are working to help create a better world. And inevitably, some of the more skeptical members of the audience might say at the end, gee, I didn't know the UN impacted us that way. We really need that organization. But it, it is not a perfect organization, but it's one that we have to work with and to make it better, to improve it and to make it more effective. But Rachel Pittman, Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA, I wanna thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you for having me, Bill. It was my pleasure. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.